Hello. Welcome. We are the intern ministers at Community Church of New York in Manhattan. We are Unitarian Universalists in the process of becoming ordained clergy. In this podcast, we delve into the life of an intern minister. We explore the ways our lives and internships intersect and how this is ministerial formation. I'm Megan Henry. I'm Carrie McAvoy. And we're, and we're revving, revving up. up. <laughs> Welcome back to the second show of our second season of Revving Up. We're so glad that you're here watching, listening, and being part of our community conversation. Uh, Just a reminder, if you want to join our Facebook group, go to facebook.com groups Revving Up and you'll find out how you can subscribe and comment. And we always love to hear what you have to say about what we have to say about what you have to say, etc. Also, you can reach out at podcast at ccny.org. So how are you today, Megan? Doing pretty well. Just um, sitting here in midtown Manhattan, looking out my window at the gray skies and the rain and actually just had a little bit of thunder and lightning. So it's kind of an exciting, stormy day. And I'm excited to see if it arrives in Connecticut while we're recording. That would be pretty interesting. Yeah, it's so nice to get some rain for, I'm sure, your, you know, yard and flowers and all of those nice things. Yeah, yeah. So today we were thinking about expanding more on prayer. Last time we talked about CPEs, that's clinical pastoral education, and we started talking about prayer and um, how that's not necessarily uh, something that Unitarian Universalists come into CPE knowing how to do. Yeah, I think, well, I've been thinking about this a lot, Carrie, because I am, um, I was born and raised Unitarian Universalist. And I think that there's a certain impact that that has had on my life around some things religious and spiritual that's um, maybe a little different from, or a lot different in some cases from um, other religious traditions. And one of the things that I've really noticed is that I was not raised to know how to pray, Um, pray to God, or, you know, I I just didn't, did not learn these things. Um, No one taught me, but also I didn't, I wasn't around other people who were praying. So it wasn't like on Sunday morning, um, the preacher wouldn't be like, you know, um, dear God, you know, we are here in your presence asking for your comfort or asking for your, you know, there wasn't like a direct conversation with God that was happening. Um, And I don't know if that is true of other Unitarian Universalists, but I get the feeling that it is a little bit, but I'm also, I think that when someone comes from Um, a religious, comes to Unitarian Universalism from a religious tradition that had a a very strong prayer practice. Um, If they had a negative experience with that tradition that led them to leave it and come to Unitarian Universalism, sometimes things like prayer get then left out because they don't want to be reminded of the things that were you know, maybe hurtful or damaging for them in their previous religious tradition. Right. And also, um, one of the things I love about Unitarian Universalism is that congregations are different. You you go to one congregation and their worship service is going to be different than another. And in some, even in some congregations, they don't even use the word worship because the word worship is problematic. Um, or they don't use the G word, the God word. And, um, <laughs> or the J yeah. word. <laughs> or the J, ru- J word, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, w- from my religious upbringing, I, I grew up Catholic, and I also d- wasn't very skilled at 
um, just building a prayer because most of our prayers were very proscribed. We said the same mm -hmm. words every mass and every Sunday and maybe there was a bedtime prayer, but, and maybe a grace at dinner, but we, it, it wasn't, it wasn't um, the whole concept of an extemporaneous prayer was not something that was a big thing for Catholics, or at least in my Catholic upbringing. So um, I don't know about you, but when I arrived at CPE not feeling very skillful at it at all. Yeah, I definitely arrived at CPE not feeling skillful at prayer, but also feeling um, a little bit like I was uh, like searching around on the internet and looking at the UU worship web for prayers that I could use, right? Like, what can I use that somebody else already wrote? Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting to me that my fellow um, colleagues in my CPE cohort, who all came from um, a variety of different religious traditions, not Unitarian Universalist, but they all, there's Episcopal, United Church of Christ, Catholic, um, Orthodox, and Jewish. And they all had prayers that they just had as go-tos that they already knew that were just either like, and they could cite them from memory because they'd said them so many times or, or they just had, you know, like maybe like a, a prayer book or something like that where they could go to that, um, which is really interesting because I found that we that they and I both had the same challenge of learning to do extemporaneous in the moment prayers with patients, because if one is all, is used to just using a prescribed prayer like something that's like from the Bible or our Father or you know just having a prayer that you've memorized, it's not specific to that moment and that individual who you are with, and so they also had to learn how to pray in the moment. And um, I found it to be a really incredible and beautiful experience. I'm, I, and I'm happy to go into that a little bit more, but I'm also wondering, Carrie, if you had a similar experience to what I just talked about when you were in CPE. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, it was a little nerve wracking to, to know that that would be the expectation sometimes was to create a spontaneous prayer, but it, um, it was something that I, tr I offered at the end of every visit. It was a way for me to tie up the visit. And I think we talked about this a little bit in our last session, but just how it was a way to let them know that I had been listening and that I cared. And today um, I'm thinking about how prayer is really building a relationship with the divine. And so I found this creating this triangle between the divine and the patient and me. And it was really a, a profound moment of connection and a perfect way to wrap it up, wrap up and end a, a visit. Um, I found the same thing to be true. I, I found it was, um, so I, I would love to get into that a little bit. Is that okay? Or you want to kind of dig into yeah. a little bit of like what that means and what that looks like and what that feels like and how one creates a prayer like that. Um, I had, uh, so in clinical pastoral education, there are didactics, which are like these learning sessions that are taught by people who are, who know about a certain thing. So one of the didactics that I had in at Bellevue in my group last summer was from um, a resident, a CPE resident who is a, uh, had graduated from Union um, Theological School and was there doing a year long um, CPE residency and was about to graduate and finish that program. So had been at, at Bellevue for a year. And he did a didactic with us about how to do prayer and some of the things I'm I'm the reason I'm bringing him up is because I want to say some of the things that he taught me and I um, feel like it's fair to give him credit um, and I think his name is Jacob Gonzalez I would have to look back at my notes but and what Jacob said was um, that some of the things that really surprised me and taught me a lot were about um, asking permission to pray with the person. 
so that was the, I, I, I love that. And it's an, it's a great way to have an in. So, you know, after having a conversation for say 20 minutes with someone about what's going on in their life, what brought them into the hospital, what they're dealing with, um, maybe you hear about their family or they're, um, they're alone in the world. Um, maybe like a lot of times I was hearing about folks who lived on the street or in the shelter and were talking about their experiences and, um, what got them to that point and a lot of like hearing about their life stories, um, maybe about their treatment at different facilities, um, whether good or bad. Um, and at the end of that, it's so, it's so great to be able to have kind of like a really spiritual closer and say, I'm going to have to go soon. I'm wondering if you would be open to me saying a prayer with you, or um, can I pray for you now uh, before I leave? And I found that to be just such, just saying those words as a Unitarian Universalist, like religious humanist with a belief in something divine and sacred out there that I call God. <laughs> <laughs> it was just very new for me to, to have that kind of a conversation with people. Mm -hmm. Did you do that? And was that kind of how you did it too? Yeah. Yeah. As I was wrapping, as I was going, I said, well, I, I, I need to go, but would you like to pray together before I leave? And then if they said yes, I would ask them if they wanted to pray or if they wanted me to pray, because um, I, I always love to hear them pray because there are so many different ways to pray. And I wanted to pray in a, in a way that would mean something to them, like paying attention. If, if they were, if they went first, I would know how they wanted to invoke God, because that's, that's part of what a prayer is. Who, who are you praying to? And um, like, and that's a God. question we just ask them, right? Like, who would you yeah. like me to pray to? Right. Um, and the, and you know, they might say God, but they also might say Jesus and mm -hmm. they might say in Jesus's name, which is something that I came across a lot that. I was like, I came to understand that if the prayer was not in Jesus's name, it didn't feel like a prayer to that person. Mm -hmm. And so it was really such an edu like an educational experience of being, meeting somewhere where they are and being with them and really honoring their needs as, you know, as a chaplain in the hospital, it's not about me, it's about them. Right. and serving their needs right right and then um then just structuring the prayer like i was told one of the didactics that i was told about was praise plight and plea so you start by praising um the the who you are praying to and then you tell them what's going on and then you ask for something so the the praise the plight the plea mm. and and that reminds me of Anne Lamott in her, she's got a book about prayer and the name of it is Help, Thanks, and Wow. Mm. And as, as the three different kinds of prayer, like help me, the plea, um, and the thanks, the praise, and the, and the wow, the awe, like, oh my gosh, it's so amazing. And then just this, and then just praising, I think that's maybe part of the, the awe part of it. But yeah, so there's a lot to it. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I, um, I, I found that one of the things I learned, um, was that it's part of CPE and serving as a chaplain, a, a huge part of it, maybe the whole thing <laughs> is about being present with the person who you're in a, the, who is speaking to you. So listening to that person and reflecting back what I'm hearing them saying. Maybe I say it in a little bit of a different word, like, oh yeah, so you, you, um, let me think of an example. Um, yeah, that sounds really painful. Um, you know, just, um, I hear you. I would be angry at God too right now if I were in your shoes. Tell me more about that anger. What does that, what does that feel like to you? You know, just things like reflecting back what we hear the person saying, um, and then building that into the prayer at the end. So one of the things, like I would find myself um, asking God for, to honor 
and the, the things that the person was asking for that they needed. So I would, you know, pray that you, you know, um, like there might be a dear God, I, I'm here with Tony and Tony is in the hospital here at Bellevue and he is, he is so sick and he's very, very tired and his legs are not working right now. And he is asking you to please let him walk again so that he can be in his family photo at his reunion standing with his family. And just, you know, repeat back the things that that person said that they want and that they dream of and that they, that's their heart's desire. And then ask God for those things. Tell God that the person is asking for these things and ask God to honor that. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't something that I had ever um, done before. I was actually taught kind of the opposite of that, which is, so, so that's, and, and just to say a little bit more about that, I think I was, I was raised in, with an understanding that like asking God for things like granting is like asking to have a wish granted or something like that is kind of like mm -hmm. making a wish and blowing out the candles on your birthday cake or, you mm -hmm. know, looking up at the stars and like starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight, <laughs> which I may wish I might get the wish I wish tonight and like wish for the thing or, mm -hmm. you know, asking for like something for Christmas from Santa Claus or something like I, I, I grew up with the impression that that's what prayer that asked God for things was. Yeah. And yeah. what I learned this summer is that it's not like, it's not that it's a sigh of someone's soul reaching out into the universe, expressing their deepest um, needs and wants and desires and hurts and having someone listen. It's or really powerful. Just saying it or just saying it the act of saying it yeah. changes, changes right yeah 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 right like the person saying it out loud to someone who is listening is giving them is empowering them to say the thing but then hearing that person repeat it back to them mm -hmm. to god mm -hmm. a person who's a chaplain who's talking to god for them with them mm -hmm. holding their hand and talking to god like that's it's so powerful and Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that I learned at CPE this summer, but I feel like that's probably, maybe that's the thing I'm walking away with. That's kind of the biggest, mm -hmm. um, learning for me spiritually and personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember there were moments. Um, so one of the units that I would frequent was the burn unit and often people in the burn unit are unconscious. And so, um, in those moments, I would, I would sing. Oh, and, that's beautiful. Um, so I would sing Amazing Grace, which I think is a prayer. And I would sing mm. Spirit of Life, which I think is a prayer. Oh. And, then, um, so there are many, many, many different ways to pray. And it doesn't even need to be words. Like, um, like when we were preparing for this session, we were talking about walking a labyrinth or, um yeah the, the little zen garden things or you know mm -hmm. mindfulness is a profound prayer it's building your relationship with the divine i think mm -hmm. is a prayer that's what the whole purpose of prayer is well it certainly worked for me let me tell you having conversation multiple conversations with god every day <laughs> over the summer really <laughs> um built my relationship with god for sure it's like i don't usually talk to god this much <laughs> um but it would certainly um gave me a different kind of relationship with god and my understanding of god you know and um with also just with uh my spirit and my own spirituality and I, at the end of my program, did my final day, my final um, pro verbatim was a verbatim with God. So I did, I had my own conversation with God and wrote it down and then kind of analyzed it and reflected on it spiritually, which is great. Yeah, some profound moments. 
So something else I wanted to just note about uh, prayer as I experienced it and my presence in the hospital setting, that the particular hospital that I was in, but I would imagine this can happen definitely anywhere, but I was um, just like really aware of the kind of power and authority that comes with being a chaplain. Um, and wearing that chaplain tag around my neck and you know, wearing kind of like business casual street clothes around the hospital, not wearing, you know, scrubs and not wearing a collar or something like that, you know, so I, you know, I was definitely presenting as a chaplain, but not medical staff, not hospital staff. And um, also as a white woman, like I'm walking into people's rooms, um, and you know, every every time I would walk into somebody's room, I was, I really tried to be aware of the identity that I was bringing with me. Um, I'm 49. Um, in the hospital, I always wore my hair up, and um, I, you I know, mean, was wearing a mask and everything. And I think I looked maybe a little bit younger, white woman, and I, you know. I guess I presented kind of like caring confidence, you know, but definitely um, was aware that most of my patients who I was serving were um, housing insecure um, and may, many don't have any health insurance. And that's one of the reasons that they're out of Bellevue and are um, all, you know, many African American, many, um, Asian patients, many um, Latinx patients. So, um, and India, my, there was, I had several folks from India that I um, was serving. And so I just, I felt like an extra responsibility as a like a white woman coming into people's rooms with the power and authority as a chaplain, all of those layers, right? So it was just really, I wanted to be really aware of it and just notice myself and my, you know, when was it, a? I, I just tried to be really respectful of every single person and their needs and people in the hospital often, not only were they um, different from me for so many of those identity aspects, like racially and social, socially and economically, and often religiously. So many of the people who I was encountering were um, very deeply religious and primarily Christian. And so for me, it was just really important to be, to defer to them and to listen to them and to be really respectful and to give them, to empower them, to give them some thing that they could feel real, that like a bright spot or something they could feel good about, about having been in that hospital stay. And that if they, what, if they wanted to tell me to go away, then I would just go away and respect it. Um, just, you know, all of those, I just, it was like a whole extra layer. And I felt like my CPE program was really good at having us, every single one of my co six cohort were white. And so it was really an interesting dynamic and we talked about it and we were aware of it and our educator helped us remember that and talk about it and think about it. And, and, in, and I just think it's important for people to know that when people are doing a CPE program, at least in my experience, we are also thinking about all of those layers of identity also. It's not just like, oh, like, this is all just a flattened, like, you know, it's all about just like religion and I'm going to listen to you and pray with you. Like there's so many more things that we think about and that we take into consideration and that we build into what our program and what we're doing in our learning. And it's, I guess there's a lot of intercultural kind of competency work that happens in the program. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That was similar to my program as well. Um, and just from, uh, I remember in a pastoral care class, 
someone had said, um, you cannot tell anything from someone who's wearing a, a crucifix around their neck. It's just, it means some, you cannot assume anything. So I would always try to come in humbly and, um, and try to see the person as a blank slate. Like I have no, I don't know anything about you. And so let's, if you want me to talk with you, I'm more than happy to stay here and just talk or just sit here or whatever. So just trying to come into it with a whole new, um, just openness to whatever happens in that space to creating whatever happens in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually have a pretty interesting kind of funny story to, to end with if we want to do that. All right, so I was working in, this was very early on in my CPE and I was shadowing one of the experienced residents who was about to graduate. And um, I was in the emergency department and it was packed like, every room was full and they had like the, you know, the, the beds out in every space, like that you'd be like squeezing between beds just to get from one place to the other. Like there were no open areas because it was just completely full and packed. And um, th so there's two things. One thing I noticed is that no one was really um, stopping to talk to and paying attention to two different Muslim women who I noticed were out in the middle in these beds in different areas. And, you know, they were wearing hijab. And so I talked to both of them and, you know, brought them water and like interacted with them because I, I, I noticed that they weren't, it just felt like they weren't getting very much attention. And um, then I heard like some yelling and like, there was like some activity over at one end and the, um, speaking of, there's a siren going by right now, I think you can hear it. Um, There was the, the um, resident chaplain that I was following was a white male and um, probably in my age range-ish, maybe a little bit younger, 40s. And um, he was like, oh, let's go check that out. Um, let's see what's happening over here. And there was, um, there was a white male who had been um, arrested and was wearing like the orange jumpsuit and was um, handcuffed to a, one of the things, the beds, and he had um, police with him. And it was, you know, it was rough. He had, a, he had up and had a really rough time. He was very agitated. He was very upset. And the one thing that really calmed him down was that he wanted um, a rosary. And we had some of the plastic um, rosaries and the policeman said it was okay to give it to him. Um, we weren't sure because it's a ligature kind of um, issue, but they said, yeah, yeah, get, go ahead and, uh, and give it to him. And we brought it to him and he looked at it and he was like, yeah, oh, great. Thanks. Um, what am I supposed to do with this? How do I do it? How do I, and it was just so like, it was just kind of, so it just cracked me open. I was like, it was like my first week, you know, doing clinicals. And it's just like that, I don't know how to do that. First of all, <laughs> Um, and I'm going to have to learn that and find a little sheet of paper that tells people how to do it. And, you know, all of that, but just the notion that the thing, the one thing that he really wanted was something to hang on to that felt familiar to him, that he could have something. He wanted to have something that he could hold on to. He's handcuffed. Like this is, there's not much agency in that situation. And, um, but he didn't know how to do it. And he didn't know how to do, do the prayer. Um, but he knew that there was something, uh, there was a reason that he could, that he, that he should, or that he, you know, it felt familiar. Um, and just that kind of, it just seems like we all, like many of us in many different situations and circumstances, there is, we're looking for some comforting ritual, um, something to ground us, something to um, just help us get centered uh, something that maybe is familiar from childhood or even just from like, this is what I think you're supposed to do if you're a religious person. And I need that right now. Um, so it was just really interesting. And um, I thought a lot about that, just that, that need to have that thing, that religious object 
um, something to hold on to. And then also knowing that there's something there that one wants. Um, and if we can provide that as religious leaders, as people who are in community with other human beings who are seeking and looking for those kinds of grounding rituals and um, actions, then that's a that's like a really beautiful thing. And I feel like that's that's ministry. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening, for watching, for being part of our community. And feel free to email us at podcast at ccny.org or go on Facebook groups and find the revving up group um, and we'll see you back here soon tell us about your prayer experiences we'd love to hear it yeah. um what is prayer for you what kind of experience have you had with prayer is it something new for you that you want to explore and um is that something that we might be able to to help you with or or do, would you like to help us a little bit because we could use it too <laughs> absolutely <laughs> all right everybody have a good one Bye. Bye.